Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I am Bishop Basil Edwards, invite you to join us right here on Tobago Inspirational Network every Sunday evening at 4 p.m. for the program Standing on the Rock. Together we will journey through the scriptures to have a better understanding of the Holy Word of God. Standing on the Rock every Sunday 4 p.m. on Tobago Inspirational Network. Today again, we want to thank God for another opportunity where we can spend this time with Him. I want to thank all of my viewers, those who begin to enjoy the Word of God. Yes, some people may think that I'm harsh. Some people may think that I'm, I'm a little too, you know, how I may see things. But if a spear is a spear, if a cup is a cup, if a spoon is a spoon, and if uh, whatever you may use, what it is, it is. And we can't change that. But I hope that you are getting clarity as to what I'm saying. To, uh, today again, I want to share with you about do not sow discords among brethren. So today, I'm actually dealing with the body of Christ. And for those who are not even Christian, you can get a little taste of this, but mostly for the body of Christ. In Proverbs chapter 6 and the verse 16, give us these words, and then we go right down to our 21, 22. He said, there, Six things do the Lord hate, yet seven are an abomination unto him. The first one, a proud look. The second, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, to the heart that devise wicked imagination, feet that swift to run to mischief, a false witness, and he that li and that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discords among brethren. Verse 20 said, My son keep the commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart and tie them above thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. Those words are taken from Proverbs chapter 6, from verse 16 right down to verse 22. <clears throat> As I said, my topic is that um, do not sow discords among the brethren, so you know it's important not to do that. The book of Proverbs is written by a very intelligent, wise, one of the wisest men that we ever think about pass through the entire region and the, 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 the level of Christianity that we probably would have had in that day and time as a, as a Jew came out from the lineage of David, which is we know to be Solomon. So just give me a minute as I pray. Father, I thank you for your words. Bless the hearers. Bless everyone that will listen today. May you continue to bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name. Give them clarity, in Jesus' name. Amen. So what happened, <clears throat> as a wise young man growing into manhood and growing into maturity, he write because the Bible says when Solomon asked God, he did not ask God for money, he asked him for wisdom that he may know how to lead his people, the children of Israel. And Solomon, in his review, as he continued to grow, he would have used some very important statement. Even today, those words are still effective and can challenge our hearts as believers to tell us that even as Christians, we can make pitfall and we can do things that are not really pretty to the kingdom of God. I am sure how the psalmist, how Solomon would have started off his words or his information. He has trapped us as believers to know that if such a thing is in the word of God. And I like how he penned those words. And those words are penned in a specific way not only to condemn us, but to make us aware of how our Almighty God think 
and how he reigns, how he does things as the one who is omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, which is here, there, and everyone, where, and omniscient that knows all things. He is using God as our the mark for us to understand that he is Jehovah, the Almighty, who is in control of everything. So therefore, here is our Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon is now giving us information and telling us what we are doing even today, even in the church. He was speaking to, yes, to the Jewish people and to the entire world, but for us, the church today, he's still speaking to us. And I like those words, as he said in verse 16, these six things that the Lord hated, yet seven are an abomination to him. And we understand very clearly six things that God hates. And when you take a close look at these words that Solomon would have released to us and then still make us or give us understanding as to what he's speaking about there is nothing less from the truth that this is a time in which we understand very clearly we still are going through those same sort of behavioral pattern and i like how he put it across even in verse 17. he said one of the things that condemn us or bring us to a place of this reproof is a proud look there are many people who you can see and know for sure, and even the life that they live, they are considered to be very proud and proper people. Too proud to be a Christian. You are so proud that you believe that nobody else is like you. And therefore, even to the entire world that is out there, sometimes when they look at you and your behavioral pattern, the question is asked, is they really Christians like people? Are they living the life as a Christian or are they just like us? Sometimes we are like the men of the world who never accepted Christ, who don't have a clue of what Christianity is about and probably doing better than us because of, our, of that particular prototype of our life that proved and looked like as though we are so proud. A proud look. You can see that look. When a person is proud and puffed up and, and look as beyond, his, and behind, be, beyond himself or behind, beside himself, you can see that. And most of the time, when you look at it, you ask yourself the question, is there such a stain? Is, just, is there such a, 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 a kind of a particular protocol that we can look into now and say, this is how Christians must live? Christians are not proud people. Christians are Christians who live like Jesus Christ really is and are as in the past. Jesus never displayed that kind of proud look and make everybody feel that he's not important or he's more important than everybody else. He reached the unreachable. He reached even to those that seems that has no life in themselves. He reached the man not just being crippled, but he reached the man who had leprosy. Leprosy is a disease that's rotten from inside out. And you can see them, you can know them because they have a stench. A lying tongue. That's another one. We got Christians who are making joke. And the joke tells them to be lies. And when he tells somebody something else, it's as though you're making it up and saying, you know, it's a joke I was making. We got to be careful of the words that we use out of our mouth and keep spreading propaganda on people's names, telling people all sorts of lying things. You are a child of God. You must speak the truth and no lies. Are you hearing me, somebody? These are also in the body of Christ. What again? Hands that shed innocent blood. You are a Christian or you are a child of God or you are in and out of Christianity. And when somebody does something, you are quick to find a way of make showing that innocent blood has been shed. And sometimes I heard people say this, even as Christians said, when you are up against the wall and there seems to be no way out. If I was in the days when I was before, I go find somebody to pass them out or pay somebody to do what they got to do. These are not words we use as Christians. Hands that shed innocent blood. As long as you did not do it, but you pay somebody to do it, it means that you are guilty as the person is. And we got to be careful of that. 
a heart that divides wicked imagination. These are not supposed to be in the, in the Christian fraternity. But we also will have people in that way. When a man backslides of the Lord, trust me, he's worse than a snake. He's worse than an infidel. Because why? When a man backslides from the Lord, the devil is going to use him to mash up and try to mash up the, the, the kingdom of God. A heart that divides wicked imagination. Just imagine your imagination becomes so wicked. Why? Because you devise it. You, you sit down and you plan what, how you can get even, how you can get this thing work out. And even sometimes, even in the body of Christ, and I like what the Bible says, you know, when Jesus Christ is Satan desire to sift you like wheat, Peter, but I've prayed for you. Say, but when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. So even in the body of Christ, we have people who may have baptized, who may have given their life to Christ, but lack of reading the word, what happened, your thoughts, your mind, your imagination become a battlefield. Amen. It become a battlefield. Why? Because of what your thoughts is. Sorry. Because of where your thoughts is. The enemy knows what to do. He knows exactly how to do it and how to do it to make us feel less than who we are in the body of Christ. We're going further down. It's a feat that be swift in running to mischief. You understand what that means too? Feet that what? Swift to run into mischief. Always finding some room, some way to make mischievous Doing something to make mischief, conflict, confusion, everything to do with that. We are not to live like that. We are not to be like that. We always have to be above those circumstances. As a child of God, you should not have, you should not, your feet should not be swift in running to what? To mischief, conflict and confusion. Lower down. Finding the joy of verse 19, a false witness, and he that speaketh lies. So a false witness is one who formulate lies and conflict, saying things about somebody that is not there. Just like how the two witness find information to when they bring him into where they more or less would have wanted to crucify Jesus. Is finding the appropriate word to find that and to be able to bring him to naught so they can condemn him. That's who are false witnesses. Always finding information to be able to belittle the person so he can be destroyed. It's a false witness. And the last one. I like that. And the reason why I like that is because it's very prevalent in the church today. Sixteen God hate, but seven is an abomination. And the seventh one is he that saw it. He that saw it what? Discord among brethren. <clears throat> he that saw it discord among brethren. <laughs> Meaning that you are in a church. And you are pretty towards information. Whether it's from the pastor, the congregation, whatever it may be. And the information sometimes is where you might be able to go, you might have been able to go to God and ask and speak to God about it. But you know what happened? We start to be little leakers. We are like drip pipe. We drip so much that every mount around us, every person around us get the information. Drip. A jib pipe is placed upon a bed. And exactly where you want to plant the plant, you actually put the hose there, knowing that is where the pipe is dripping from. In the body of Christ, we find we have too many people in the church that mount is too loose. And everything we do is about us. And you're always looking for confusion. Sowing discord among brethren is one, is not just sowing discord but the level of confusion in that particular category in that bracket it's too much it's not supposed to be like that that you're finding means and way to sow discords among brothers it's like you're finding things to to mash up the church of jesus christ conflict and confusion and 
commerce. I want to use the word commerce, too many commerce in the body of Christ. You, you just hear something, you not even know, you're not sure if it is true or lie, but you want to be able to share it so you can pull down the other person. The Bible saying that is so in this court among brethren, or taking information to another person and being able now to collect that information so it goes so vile and goes so far that you are now discouraged people from going forward. Because it's discord among the brethren. It didn't say that among people, among the brethren. And we have that in too many churches. Corruption, conflict, confusion. Discord have so many different avenues that it can go. It can mash up the church. And that is not what it's supposed to be like. And this is not him or her. This is about the demonic spirit that is behind him or her that is creating that monster. It's not supposed to be like that. When we hear information, it's to build and not break. And the Bible is telling us that this particular show in this court among brethren is abomination unto God. It is an abomination. It's not just something God hates. God said, it's an abomination to me. You're going too far. When you're going too far, it's not easy. An abomination to me. When you got the time, you must look up the word abomination. You will know how serious God is. He says, six things I hate, but this one is an abomination to me. The seventh one is an abomination. Seventh means completion. It means that God has completed the cycle, and God is saying, it's time for me to get this thing out of the way. Get you out of the way. Get that system out of the way, because it has nothing to do with God. All it has to do with is self and selfishness, and you who sow the discord among the brethren, so you want to mash up. The church of God. Let's take, for instance, for Peter. Peter betrayed Christ with a kiss. He betrayed him. But we also find the disciples who were with Jesus. We have 70 men who were with Jesus. And they were doing a fantastic job. And the job that they were doing, it was very excellent. But we find a group of 70 men. When Jesus Christ said, my body is Bread indeed, and my drink, uh, my blood is drink indeed. And they was not fascinated with it. And maybe it spread a little further. And the leading person in that room would have been able to encourage those that would have heard the same statement. Let us not go forward again. Let's move from here. And the Bible said they leave Jesus and they went away. What their action was, they would have sown the seeds. Not only of rebellion, but discord among the brethren. And that those seeds of discord was to eliminate the other disciples that Jesus chose, which was 12. And what happened, and when they were doing that, um, Jesus recognized that the disciples were discouraged. And Jesus asked the question, will you also go away of because of what you just heard? And they said, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou have the word of eternal life. When discord is so among brethren, and you know it is discord, we're supposed to let people know it is the word of God that stands and nothing else but stand. We are having done all to stand. So the only thing that stands, even in this time that we are living, it is the word of God and nothing else. Don't let anybody sit on this court among you and tell you foolishness. You rather condemn them or rebuke them. That's why Paul said to Timothy, anybody come to you with any other different doctrine, rebuke them. And the rebu rebuke is not a bad word. Either. It's just a simple method of saying, I am not interested in what you have to offer me. No, I'm not interested. No way am I interested in what you're offering to me because that's not what it's supposed to be like. Amen? So I understand as long as you are given information that is not of God, you're supposed to let the persons know I am not interested. The moment you agree with them, you enter into the same category of sowing discord. A discord this person is, is probably look like one person, but here what has happened, from the seed is sold, it goes from people to person to person to person, and next thing you know, the entire church is in a, 
disarray or in a spirit of discord. Have you ever noticed why there are so many unsafe people that are not safe, especially if Christians have them as friends? Because what they did, they shared so much with them about what is happening in the church. Your pastor make a mistake. Why should it reach, why should it reach your best friend to discuss him? Or a member made a mistake. Why it is that you should have a, uh, um, someone to discuss her? It's not supposed to happen. How are you going to tell an unsaved man about somebody in the church who's having a problem? You're not supposed to. An unsaved man is not saved until he's saved. And when he's saved, now you can share that so they all can pray about it together. But as long as he's not saved, do you think you are going to win him into the body of Christ? He will say, if you are there and you can tell me about them, why should I come there to be there with you? That does not make sense. So when Christians have unsaved people as their best friend, I am saying that you are in for in a situation whereby you have to be careful what you're saying. I'm not saying that you cannot have an unsafe man as your best friend because you would have been there before that would have happened, but you have to learn the principle that kingdom business can only be shared if you are winning them to Christ. Beside that, you don't, you don't, you don't share with un unsaved people what happened in the kingdom of God, except they want to come and taste and see that Jesus Christ is Lord. My greatest joy of all time is that we come to the place where God receive the glory and the honor. My thing is that we must always understand because he loves us. We often have the time where we can face tomorrow. Because of his love, we are in better position. So my encouragement to you today, the only way you can find yourself in a better place of not sowing discords among brethren, I will give you what you need to do in verse 20, 21 and 22. He said, for you not to be in that condition, my son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. So he's giving instruction to correct those six things and the seventh one that bring an abomination to him. Number one, we must understand, you got to bind the word of God in verse 21 continually up on thy heart. So you need to bind the word of God. And you know what it means by to bind something. We're not talking about binding spirit in the Old Testament as what Jesus Christ would have said. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. But the word of God needs to be bind in to tie, in to tie in your heart and continue to be able to tangle in and up so that it does not move easily. Have you ever had or string or tread nut up and you are trying to untangle it? Is that what our heart supposed to be like in the word of God? So we bind the word of God continually upon our heart, tie them about our neck. The word of God is tied about our neck. Amen, somebody. So it's important for us to see that and to know that. So I know definitely that the word of God is tied on our neck. Amen, saint, saint of God. So when you tie the word of God around your neck, it's like a chain around your neck, like an ornament. Amen. And here we sit there. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. And when thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. So the word of God is just like that to us. Amen. Today, I want to thank you for listening. Most of all, I want to thank you as family, as husbands and wife, to those who are very, very friendly and very um, intimacy with your wife or with your husband. I salute you today. Today, I heard so many different stories of how men treat their spouse. They glean from them, they take from them everything that they have, and afterwards, they'll leave them hanging. Some divorce their women or their husbands or their wife with lump sum money owned to the bank. May I say to us today, these are not all to be. These are not the things that we're supposed to do and to make people feel less than what they are and who they are. May I encourage us today, you are given a responsibility. Your responsibility at any given time is to love your spouse. 
Just as how I love my wife, I am so happy that she's in my life. She is my best friend, Agatha Dillon Edwards. And I'm saying to us, for men and women who have your spouse, who have your wife, and if you're not treating her good, I ask you please, may you treat this woman as caring and loving. A woman is not in front of you. She's not behind you. She's by your side. Decision making is both of you all. Um, compliment is very important that you compliment your wife. I'm not understanding how husbands love to compliment other women, but when they reach their wife and you come home, your wife is very unable to compliment because you don't compliment her. Maybe she has to go to the store and buy something nice that you can see, and so you can continue to compliment her because you see her the way you want to see her. But compliment your wife, sir. Love her, sir. The Bible says the husband must love and the wife be submissive in love. You cannot submit to somebody who do not love you. Amen? So the more he loves you, is the more you will submit. I want to bless you today. For those of you who are sick mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. We can sick spiritually, and sometimes that is not a good place to be. But physically, we want to be the place where God wants us to be. So today, I declare God's blessings upon you, upon your family, upon your wife, upon your children, everything to do with you, upon your house, I mean upon your work, in, within the workplace that you work, even to the people that you work with sometimes, you may not be going, doing well with them, but you can do better. All I'm asking you, show God's love. Speak of God's love. Give them God's love. And let the peace of God be with you. Of course, I know he cared and he loved you. So for you who are in the program continuously, if you have not heard before Easter, because I know Easter is just around the corner, I want to bless you and I want to say have a very blessed Easter. I'm hoping that I will be able to present my Easter message to you when that time come around and to let you know the very significant and the important of Easter as they may say. Amen. Jesus makes the difference in our life. May you have a blessed weekend. Until we see you again, Shalom. I see, I Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I am Bishop Basil Edwards. Invite you to join us right here on Tobago Inspirational Network every Sunday evening at 4 p.m. for the program Standing on the Rock. Together we will journey through the scriptures to have a better understanding of the Holy Word of God. Standing on the Rock Every Sunday, 4 p.m. on Tobago Inspirational Network